Uh, it happened once in one of the conferences that I, I was with Dr. Sragiddin, and the, uh, one of the participants was talking to him about biology, and at the end of the uh, discussion, that man asked Dr. Sragiddin, where did you study biology? Actually, he told him that I'm, I studied engineering. This man, he is engineer among engineers. He is scientist among scientists. A politician among politicians. A writer among writers. I could say Shakespearean among, among does, it, does it work? Well, they, uh, actually he's a poet among poets too. This is not my definition. Actually, it was mentioned to me by one of you yesterday. And I could go and go and go to an endless list, actually. But um, for this conference specifically, I could say one thing. He is the man behind all what you have been living during the last four days, last three days and today. Not that only, and much, much more. Please join me to welcome Dr. Sragildi. Thank you, Dr. Muhammad Faham. Uh, I'd like to say a few words at the beginning of this that, uh, uh, you know, we, we did vote uh, Dr. Richard Ernst as our uh, favorite person, but uh, uh, as everybody knows, who knows me, I always support youth, and I'm always supporting uh, uh, women. So uh, my pick for the person of the conference is the future biovision next, next, next. <laughs> Who spontaneously decided to lie on the floor in the, in the lobby and took the biovision program and was writing notes to herself. And uh, we just wonder what she wrote in there, but I think I found her an inspiration, I'm sure so do you all. So, back to the conference and back to the task we have. My friends, the task of summing up is never easy and it is, as Shakespeare has said, a moment of parting and parting is such sweet sorrow. Before I try my hand at summarizing something, I think special thanks are due to a number of people. I'd like to start with a special thanks to Philippe de Marescaux for his gift of BioVision in collaboration with BioVision Alexandria, for his gift of BioVision 2009, invitations to the participants from the developing world here. He will waive the registration fees for BioVision Lyon. So what you have to do is to arrange to find the cost of travel and subsistence, but uh, Philippe will ensure that they will waive the, the registration fees. The topics are topics of our times. We will be discussing our cities and our lives on the one hand and looking at the cutting edge of the life sciences and everything from uh, the food feed fuel crisis to biorobotics. So thank you, Philippe de Maesco. I'd like to extend thanks to the sponsors of this event and their logos are on the programs and I'm grateful to them from the Qatar Foundation to us to all the other participants. And I would like to extend my thanks to the speakers and the participants to the chairs and the rapporteurs, each and every one. But particularly, I would like to extend a very profound thanks uh, to the organizers. And uh, while you kindly applauded me, I don't think that was true or fair. I may have uh, guided a bit what was going on. Uh, like somebody once said, you know, about the orchestra conductor, what is this guy doing? He didn't play a single note. 
Well, let's hear from all the people who actually played all the notes. And they are Dr. Muhammad Faham and the team here. Please stand up. The team, stand up. All of the team. Come on, stand up. Roha, Ulfat, Hagar, please stand up. Roha, Omar, stand up. All of you stand up, come on. And I must tell you that in addition to all these people, there is a number of people who are not here because their duties force them to be elsewhere, whether they are in the print shop, the security people, the drivers, the travel office, the tour, tour guides, uh, the reference librarians, all of them have really done a contribution. And so I salute them as well. But last but not least, I think you will agree with me that despite the fact that he doesn't want to be singled out, he deserves to be singled out, Dr. Muhammad Faham. So, now let me move to my task, which is this kind of closing speech for a conference such as this. Under the banner of From Promises to Practice, we met, we shared our knowledge, we pooled our experience. Three days, 39 sessions later, reflecting on 147 presentations plus the presentations that we have just heard, and countless discussions, what have we achieved? I think we leave here incredibly enriched by the thoughtful presentations, the hearty discussions, and yes, the vehement disagreements. And I believe that we can rightly say that in the crucible of debate, tempered by civility and mutual respect, we found a common ground, a profound commitment to the welfare of the human family, the entire human family. We refuse to forget the voiceless masses and recognize within that word, the masses, individual human beings, our brothers, our sisters, not to be forgotten in the anonymity of remoteness. And that is important. That in the time of the inhumanity of people to people. And further, I think we have also braided together the different strands of the puzzle that we confronted. Why do the promises of scientific breakthroughs not being translated into the practices that alleviate poverty and alleviate misery of millions of the environment for future generations? We recognized the need for change and action based on a common purpose, action that recognizes the past and current successes and builds upon them, action by all actors, on all stages, to address the priorities of our times and to bring the blessings of peace and the blanket of security to all the members of the human family. We specifically focused on actions in the domains of food and hunger, on public health and what I have termed as private medicine, on the environment and the economy. And we recognize the needs for public-private partnerships we recognize also that actions must be guided by policies that are grounded in a broad political consensus that involves all stakeholders, locally, nationally, regionally, and internationally. My friends, this has been an exceptionally important meeting. For we meet in the shadow of a great crisis, greater than any we have known in a whole generation. An explosion in the prices of energy and food has given us stratospheric and rising prices that are threatening the very foundation of our societies, just as they expose 
the folly of our past policies. And looming above that brewing, brewing maelstorm is the specter of climate change, which is advancing upon us with frightening speed. Even if I choose to express them here in the more colorful concerned citizen, rather than in the detached discourse of the scientific observer and the rational analyst. For today, I issue a clarion call for us to indeed stop pining for promises of the new tomorrow and start changing the practices of today. And with that clarion call, I thank the distinguished speakers, the great scientists, the experienced statesmen, the dedicated men and women who have graced our panels and our meeting rooms these last few days. I thank them for the knowledge they have brought, the experiences they have reported, the insights they have shared, and the commitment and compassion they have shown. With that clarion call, I now turn to the youth, those whose hard work has created the new Library of Alexandria and are well on the way to make it a worthy heir to the great ancient Library of Alexandria. I turn to the youth who have come in large numbers to attend the Vision Conference. I turn to them with a passion and a promise. Rest assured that I and many other committed citizens will be with you in facing this great looming crisis that threatens the world today. We will be with you as we push back that new set of threats and open the door to new possibilities, new possibilities where the poor, the weak, the marginalized will become the producers of their own bounty and welfare and not the recipients of charity or the beneficiaries of aid. And that, my friends, will require that we fight, that we fight to reject dogma, and adopt rationality and the scientific method. Fight to include all of the human family in our concerns. Fight to change priorities. Fight to change policies. Fight to create awareness of the consequences of inaction. To this fight, this new generation, whose vanguard you represent, must bring its abilities and a sense of moral outrage. Yes, moral outrage. It is inconceivable that the significant improvements have been achieved over a generation in food production per person should be rolled back and that the promise of longer, healthier and more productive lives should remain tantalizingly out of reach for a large part of the human family. Due to a confluence of forces and events, food as well as energy is once more becoming scarce and, and expensive. And already there are some things going hungry in a world that can provide that most basic of all human needs. In the 19th century, almost 200 years ago, some people looked at the condition of slavery and said that it was monstrous and unconscionable, that it must be abolished, and they were known as the abolitionists. And they did not argue from economic self-interest, but argued from moral outrage. They said that this condition of slavery is contrary to everything we believe it means to be human. Well, today I say that the condition of hunger in a world of plenty is equally monstrous and unconscionable and it must be abolished and we all must become the passionate new abolitionists.
We must with the same zeal and moral outrage attack the complacency that would turn a blind eye to the silent holocaust which claims some 40,000 hunger-related deaths every day. I have looked into the eyes of those who are hungry. And in the depth of hopelessness, I saw the spark of the indomitable human spirit that rises above the challenge with a will to live that invites us to extend the helping hand. It is a moral outrage to turn our backs on these marginalized members of the human family. And it is a moral outrage, as Richard Ernst has said, that we should be burning the food of the poor to drive the cars of the rich. It is also a moral outrage to be continuing to release massive amounts of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere as we continue to debate targets and mechanisms in diplomatic rituals that increasingly resemble someone trying to rearrange the chairs on the deck of the Titanic. It is a moral outrage that we are not looking to the welfare of the ecosystems on which we all depend, that we are not acting as true stewards of the earth, this earth that we did not inherit from our fathers but which we borrowed from our children. That's a theme we shall return to many times in many events this coming year at the Library of Alexandria and to those many events you are all cordially invited. These themes of justice, human dignity, peace, security, environment, sustainable development are the staples of my talks with young people like yourselves because in the nobility of your spirit, in the exuberance of your youth, in the quality of the education you have received, in the unsullied idealism that you possess, in the dedication to our common humanity that you bring, I find the hope of mastering the great scientific revolution of our times and for building better tomorrows. The secret of success will be more in the bedrock of your values, inherited and learned, than in the specific knowledge that you have gained today. But certainly you have learned to learn, but more importantly, you have grown to care. So harness your skill, your imagination, and your determination to create a better world for all, not just for yourselves. The challenge is great, but it must be met. For consider, for a moment, the alternative of inaction, the alternative for Egypt and the world if we continue with business as usual. For there is a tide. There is a tide of humanity, millions of young people demanding the right to a decent life, a life without fear or despair, a chance to break free of the misery of poverty. And that tide, that unstoppable tide of human ambition will not be denied. And if it is denied, then it will be a tide of anger, of hate, of violence that will engulf all before it and consume us all in its fiery embrace of rejected present and foregone tomorrows. There is a tide, a tide of suffering, a tide of people racked by disease, robbed of livelihoods, a tide of children, malnourished, stunted, deprived. They haunt our television screens and our dreams in Sudan, in Somalia, in Burma, in Korea. All our brothers and sisters, our children, our fellow human beings left to their fate. While a new class of rich consumers discusses the prices of everything and the value of nothing. There is a tide of pollution from our cities, our cars, and our factories. A tide of destructive chemicals in the water we drink, the food we eat, the air we breathe. There is a tide of ignorance and greed. There is a tide of advertising images that invade our living rooms and dull our senses and shape our consciousness all at the same time. A tide of news that comes in, but news that washes out yesterday's stories of pit and moment with today's latest gossip and trivia. Famine, 
in Niger. And now let's move you to the latest image from the runway in the fashion collection in Milan. And now we shall move to the baseball scores. Where is the sense of priorities? Everything is trivialized. A tide of information blurring meaning in countless billions of bits and bytes. There is also a tide of intolerance, fanaticism and obscurantism that wants to stop the march of time and freeze our minds and that teaches hatred and fear. And against that tide, we must harness another tide. For there is a tide, the tide of new awareness, the tide of understanding, of caring, a tide of awareness that the rights of all women, minorities, the weak and the poor are indivisible from our own. There is a tide of awareness that we cannot let the world drift into inequality, misery and environmental degradation. There is a tide of knowledge, science and new technologies that can be harnessed for the benefit of all. Yes, there is a tide in the affairs of men which taken at the flood leads on to fortune. Fortune, not just in terms of more economic growth, fortune in terms of true well-being, fortune in terms of leaving a better world for our children. Yes, there's a tide that leads on to fortune. Omitted, all the voyage of their lives is bound in shallows and in miseries. And if we fail to change the way people think about themselves and about the world, if we fail to engage the streets of our cities and the fields of our countryside, then the poor will indeed suffer. The world will indeed be harmed and our future will indeed be bound in shallows and in miseries. And on such a full sea are we now afloat and we must take the current when it serves or lose our ventures. The sea is indeed full. It is full of threats but it is also full of promise. We have the opportunity. We have the opportunity not just to navigate this sea, but in fact to show how we can create a new society and a better tomorrow. For there is a tide in the affairs of men which taken at the flood leads on to fortune, omitted all the voyage of their lives is bound in shallows and in miseries. On such a full sea are we now afloat and we must take the current when it serves or lose our ventures. But we will not lose our ventures. We will create the new world guided by a vision, a vision of the future, a vision of a caring society where in keeping with the edicts of Gandhi there would be no politics without principle, no wealth without work, no commerce without morality, no pleasure without conscience, no education without character, no science without humanity, and no religion without sacrifice. It is a vision where a people's greatness is measured by the quality of the lives of their poorest citizens, and not by the size of their armies or the scale of their buildings. It is a vision where the future is for all, as open-ended as knowledge, as random as play, as surprising as human imagination and ingenuity. It is a vision of a future where the production of knowledge is a joy and the sharing of knowledge is a duty. Yes, we must change the world and we must ensure that this new millennium is indeed the millennium for all the wretched of the earth. And I believe it can be done and it must be done and by your hard work, all of you, it will be done. And so, my friends, to the many among you who are young at heart, thank you and may you keep the spark of inventiveness fanned into flames of passion by a strong commitment to better the state of the human family and of our environment. To the young I say, you are the vanguard of a new generation of this third millennium you are both heirs and artisans of the amazing global revolution in science and technology. So go forth into the journey of your lives and create a better world for yourselves and for others. Think of the unborn, remember the forgotten, give hope to the forlorn, include the excluded, reach out to the unreached, and by your actions from this day onward, 
lay the foundation for better tomorrows. Thank you each and everyone, and we shall see you on the next occasion.